Hey everyone, welcome back to the Going Scared Podcast. This is your host, Jessica Honiger, founder of the social impact fashion brand, Noonday Collection. Join me here every week for conversations on living lives of purpose by leaving comfort and going scared. I'm excited to be back with you here for our second week of the Art of Difficult Dialogue series. And let me tell you, sometimes there's nothing scarier than going into a difficult conversation. This week, we are going to continue with another powerful episode, this time with Paula Ferris. You may know Paula from the high-profile, high-stakes world of broadcast journalism, where she was co-anchor of Good Morning America Weekend and The View. Paula is a seasoned journalist with many difficult interviews under her belt and so many times where she could have leveraged her power as a journalist to take a righteous or judgmental stand. She chose over and over again to listen to people as people, not as policies, sides, or ideologies. Her training has taught her how to interview others without bias, and so I asked her to give us the Journalism 101 on today's show. Her tips on engaging uncomfortable conversations, how to talk to our kids about forming their own opinions, and in an era of blurry lines between journalism and commentary, how to do our own research and check our biases are valuable tips. Here's my conversation with Paula. I'm, I'm super excited to talk today. I have to tell you that when Austin, we're in Austin, and when we went into shelter in place back in March, I went to our office, grabbed a stack of books sitting in my office, and then just came and plopped them down in my new home office setup. And your book is at the top of the stack. And so you have been accompanying me for the past four months. Every day I walk into my office and I'm like, there's Paula. There she Aww. is. Hi, Jessica. So, so I'm just greeting you to your home office every day. Welcome. That's right. You, you, you've gotten me through a lot over the past oh. four months. Let me tell you, it's, it's oh. been a little crazy. Um, but I'm really excited to talk today. I finally had the chance to read your book and there's just so much richness there and so much courage. Thank so you. much courage in your story. Thank you. And that's really what this podcast is all about. Yeah. So we're gonna you. we're gonna get to do a deep dive. But before that, I wanted to ask, where are you now? Because I know you were in South Carolina, but yep. you live in New York. What are you guys doing right we now? We are still in South Carolina, still here, still hunkered down. So, and okay. yeah, we're loving it a lot, and we're thinking about just relocating here. I think everyone's. Um, whether it's a full reset or just like a slight pivot where everybody's thinking, hmm, it, just because I've done it this way doesn't mean I have to continue doing it yes. this way. So it's emboldened us to, to maybe realize that we can reimagine work and life and it doesn't have to be the way that it once was. It Which really is doesn't. interesting because that is really what your book is about. And you mm-hmm. had your first aha during the Twin Towers. Yeah, I Or did. one of your many first when yeah. you thought, okay, I'm going to stick a stake in the ground and I'm going to pursue this career that God's put on my heart. Mm-hmm. And now we're in kind of a, I would say it's our second big crisis or our first big crisis since then, I would say. Mm. Um, at this level. And you're right, it leads us all to a a pivot, a rethink of our priorities. It's it's such an interesting time because, yes, tragedy and opportunity can coexist, right? I think we've all seen that. Like, there's a lot of tragedy happening, but there is a reset button if we want it. But when in our history, Jessica, have we ever had an opportunity to be this united over one thing, not even in world wars? Mm-hmm. And I think it's just an opportunity to to unite, but it's also an opportunity for all of us to like reimagine and rethink and reset if we want to. That's where the opportunity Mm -hmm. can come amidst the tragedy. And we don't have to focus on the tragedy. Um, We can focus on the pivot, like you said, and the shift. Mm-hmm, but it's mm-hmm. but it's a matter of stepping into that, stepping, having the courage to do it. But I think yeah, like the first, but the first step's kind of been done for us in many regards. It's now yeah. just up to us. Okay, so tell me a little bit what your days look like because you're currently a journalist and mm-hmm. correspondent for ABC News. Your husband is he still with the uh, real estate? Yes. Yep, my husband's okay. in commercial real estate. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so he, what are your days looking like now that you're yeah. doing everything remotely? Yeah, it's it's well, my husband's job has been like like one Zoom call after another. And he hasn't even gone back to New York because, um, you know, now mm. we're entering New York. It has issued a mandate if you're coming from certain states, you have to quarantine for two weeks. And he's like, I can just, I can be just as effective here. So, you know, he manages a huge office, a commercial real estate firm, has several hundred real est- or commercial real estate agents under him. And he's just on Zoom calls all day. For me, yeah. um, it's some Zoom calls, it's some Zoom interviews, it's... I, I miss the personal connection, especially in mm-hmm. journalism. You know, you know, you're mm-hmm. just I, I the curiosity, question asking, um, but the connection. I miss that. I miss yes. that personal connection a lot. I really do. Um, but you know, to be honest, uh, I really feel like God's leading me in some other some other directions. I'm excited to. I can't talk about them right now, but mm-hmm. um, you know, I've learned in this season. Uh, and, and I write about it some in my book, but I feel like this journey keeps continuing is that I a, had to release myself from that lie that my only worth was in work or status mm-hmm. or that was my value. And then God really gave me the permission to branch out and to try mm-hmm. new things. And I'm kind of like walking in that in this season, trying to see what else, because I thought, and I think we all fall in this trap, Jessica, I'm this one thing for the rest of my life, whether I'm mm-hmm. trapped, you know, I you know, whether we've been, it, that's been ingrained in us that we were born to do this one thing and called to do this one thing. And when that one thing sh- shifts or shakes, like, who are you outside of it? So God just really gave me, A, released me from that lie that my only value was in vocation or worth was in doing. And then once he released me from that, um, he gave me the permission to branch out and try new things and to see myself multidimensionally. I don't have to be one thing forever and ever and ever. I can do things vocationally for a se- couple of seasons, you know, I can try new things. I don't have to back myself into a corner, just like we're, we're not, you know, just mind or just body, we're mind, body, soul. We are multidimensional beings and we can do new things, but it's up to us whether A, we want to realize, okay, that's not my worth. I have to remember what I'm doing, why I'm doing it and who I'm doing it for, remembering the purpose in that. You know, but just also remembering that, you know, that's not my value. And um, it gives you the courage once, once you realize that it gives you the, just, just the courage and emboldenment to, to try new things based mm-hmm. on the, uni- the mm-hmm. unique talents and gifts that we each have. You write about that. You write about the distinction between a faith calling and a vocational calling. So explain to us how that distinction sure. helped you in your journey? Because I know a lot of listeners are listening right now and they remember you from The View. They remember from GMA Weekend and they mm-hmm. even might right now be like, what happened? What yeah. happened to her? Where did exactly. she go? So what did tell us a little bit about your journey. What did broad do? Yeah, what did that crazy broad do? Yeah, I stepped away at the height of my career is what I did. I, st- I pumped the brakes and I really felt like God was asking me to slow down even though I really didn't want to. Who walks away at the height of their career? You know, uh, um, but what good is it for a man to gain the world, but to lose his soul in the process? When I looked around, Jessica, my values, my professed values were really contradicting and clashing with, with the, the choices that I was making professionally and personally. And my personal life felt like it was just out of control, but professionally I was at this high. And so when God extracted me from that, finally through a series of tragedies where he had to physically slow me down, and that's why I truly believe in this moment we're in right now, um, we can experience loss and tragedy, but we can also experience opportunity in that same breath. They are not mutually Mm -hmm. exclusive. They can coexist. Because out of my own personal tragedies, which I write about in the book, this season of hell, I'm not going to elaborate about what happened, but it was a tough season and God slowed me down. That's when I realized I needed to take a step back. I needed to pivot. Um, I needed to get off the fast track. I needed to get my life back. Um, But once I did, I realized I didn't know who I was outside of my job. I was like, Uh, I just wrapped up my everything in this thing. And it's, it's totally shifted now. So who am I outside of this? So there is this season of, you know, self-reflection, trying to figure out who I was outside of it. And that's when I realized, you know, I, I thought that I had this calling on my life. That there was this one thing I was supposed to do, that that's why I was here on this earth. And that, that message is one that we get from churches to find your calling. And it's synonymous with career. Uh, it's the message that we get from society. Who are you? What do you do for a living? You know, lean in as hard as you can. You know, it's reinforced to our kids. 
you know, what do you want to be? What do you want to do when you grow up? So there's this, it's, it's from the time where we can walk and talk, this is the message that we're getting, that our value is in doing, our value is in status, our value is in this thing, it's our value is in doing. And guess what? The doing shifts throughout our life. So if our entire identity and purpose is wrapped up in that, and when that thing shifts and shakes, which it is bound to, we're not going to know who we are. So God just revealed that we have two callings on our life. We have a faith calling, and then we have a vocational calling. Faith calling never changes. Vocational calling does. Faith calling is who we are. Vocational calling is what we do. Faith calling is why we're here on this earth. Um, it is, it, it, and it will never change. It has nothing to do with work. It has nothing to do with career. For me, my faith calling, my purpose is to love God and love people. That's it. And before it may have been, my purpose is to be the best broadcaster that I can be. And you notice when my purpose is tied to doing, then my identity is going to be rocked when that shifts. So I know my purpose now is to love God and love people. That's it. That's it. End of day. Done. My -hmm. vocational calling can and will change and has changed. Vocational calling, just think of it, vocation vehicle. It's the, it's the vehicle by which you will express your faith calling, your purpose. It's the conduit by which you'll love God and love people. Whatever you say your faith calling might be, it may be to, um, it may be, to be kind to people. Um, you know, you have to figure out what is it about you? Like, why do you feel like you're here on this earth? But it can't be tied to the doing. So for me, it's just to love God and love people. Yeah. Right. So thank you so much for just explaining the distinction between a faith calling and a vocational calling. And then you're talking about how a faith calling for you, it's loving God and loving people. Yeah. But what else can that look like for other people that might be sure. outside of your faith, Christianity? Absolutely. And I think it's important to show up as your true self, no matter who you are, um, whether you're atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Jewish, you know, Muslim. Um, I have an agnostic Buddhist friend uh, who I write about in the book, and you know, he says his faith calling, his purpose um, might be to be a respectful and kind person. So everything that he does is rooted in that. Just think of your faith calling and your vocational calling like a vine and branches. Your vine is your faith calling or your purpose, okay? It's what is it about you that, that, why do you think you're here that doesn't have anything to do with doing, but what is it about you that's not going to change? And and what do you want people to remember about you? It's the who you are, okay? That's your vine. Everything's rooted in that. And a healthy vine produces many branches. So think your different vocational branches. But your vocational branches, they're all rooted in the vine. So everything I do is rooted in, for me, loving God and loving people. My friend who's Buddhist, say everything that he does is rooted in being a kind and respectful person. So that is your purpose. That's the reason that you're here, okay? And that's something that's never going to change about you. Um, But yeah, show up as your, I think it's so important to show up as your true self, no matter matter who, um, who you are, what you ascribe to. I think if we did that in this moment, Jessica, we'd have a lot more provocative conversations and just learn a lot more from one another and tear down those walls of ignorance. Well, I'm glad that you brought that up because actually one of the big reasons I wanted to have you on the show is because we just launched our series and it it's a new series and it's all about how we can learn to agree to disagree. And in so many ways, we've lost that art of dialogue. And I know you've had to show up as your authentic self. I mean, in a place like The View, where I know you uh, you had to have an unbiased point of view anyway as a journalist. But how do you hold that tension of showing up as your authentic self while also holding the tension of Mm -hmm. being able to disagree with others? Agree. Yes. Give us a little bit of a 101 on that. Sure. I think the key is respecting one another. Okay? Respect. And being able to disagree without being disagreeable, seeing the other person. When I worked at The View, um, and I'm still good friends with Whoopi and Joy and the, and the cast, you know, if I just looked at Whoopi and Joy as policy, then all I would see is, you know, what, the, what they stood for, Democrats or, you know, their, what the beliefs that they ascribe to. Instead, I, I felt like the one thing that I learned, the resounding lesson for me in working at The View was I learned to see people for people and not people just as policy. We so often look at people and we're like, oh, she's a Democrat, she's a Republican, she's anti-abortion, you know, she's pro-cho- you know, pro-choice. We, we label people so often. 
And if we can just realize like you have a right to your opinion and I have a right to mine, I can be confident enough in my opinions and my beliefs that I don't need to persuade you. It's okay for you to believe what you believe. It doesn't make what I believe to be any less true. So it's just seeing people for people and not people as policy, but also being able to respect another person and knowing that it's not, it, it's, it doesn't make what you believe any less believable or any less true to you if you respect somebody else. Okay, you don't have to persuade every single person. And, you know, for me, it's like, what good is it if I'm a total jerk, you know, and, uh, and but I'm and I'm not rooted in love. If I'm not loving people, people are not going to listen to anything I say. So I just want to show up as my true self, encourage other people. And once they do, just just show them I can love you. I can love you as a person and I don't have to just see policy and I can respect you because you know, from my perspective, you are, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are knit together in your mother's womb, just like I was. Okay. And I can respect mm. you for that. And that's all I need to know. I don't have to try to change your mind. You can believe what you believe and I can believe what I believe. And it doesn't make either of mm. us wrong. And one of your, I mean, one of your obvious God-given values is curiosity and curiosity makes for good journalism, <laughs> but it also just makes for being a good human. And you are a master interviewer yourself. And I imagine that good interview skills are also good conversation skills that we all could learn. So I wanted to know, <laughs> could you give us a little journalism 101? I mean, I imagine when you were on this career trajectory that you actually have to, you know, I'm sure there's just like basic rules around sure. interviews. I'm sure I've broken all of them today. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> you brought up something interesting. You said my my curiosities, okay? This all goes back to finding out um, like maybe what you're geared to do. And I so often just saw myself as a broadcaster, but like, what are you good at? What do you love? And what do trusted people notice you're good at and you love? Answer those three questions. You have to check all those boxes. Like for me, curiosity, my nickname was Paula 20 questions growing up. I've always been like one to get to the bottom of the story, question asking, communicator, champion of people that made me a good broadcaster. But guess what? The curiosity, the question asking, the champion, the communicator, I can use those in a lot of different vocational capacities, Jessica. And for so long, I've been too scared to try anything different because I thought I was one thing for the rest of my life. And now that I know I can use those talents and gifts that I have, the talents and gifts that you have, the talents and gifts you know, that, that your listeners have, what are you good at? What do you love? What do trusted people notice you're good at and you love? You could use those on a lot of different branches. So ask yourself the, that, those three questions, check off every box. It might be something like, I'm a loyal person. I'm an encourager. I'm a leader, something like that. And then realize like, I can, I can branch out. I can try new things. Interviewing is really like making people feel comfortable, making people feel valued, making people feel heard, maybe making people feel seen. For me, when I go into an interview, like I want people like, I, you know, I'm, I'm interviewing political types. I'm interviewing celebrities. I feel like there's no question I can't ask as long as I ask it in a respectful manner. I think it's just being grounded in respect, but also being grounded in um, listening and and making these people feel seen. If I show up to an interview and I'm about somebody's new book or about somebody's new project and I haven't done the research to show them that I've taken the time and I care enough about this, if I haven't done the basic groundwork and shown up and done that, then they're gonna feel like I don't care and they're not gonna open up. So just making them feel heard and seen um, by doing the research um, and listening to them uh, and and just making them feel and that makes them feel comfortable and once they're comfortable with you mm -hmm. you can ask them whatever you want in a respectful manner i mean there's no, for me i feel like there's no question i can't ask people really what about how do you check your own bias uh, well because i i think i check my own bias because i recognize that i have one and i recognize that all of us have one we all have an inherent bias based upon um, our circumstances our surroundings our childhood uh where we work I, I reckon, listen, I was raised in a Christian conservative home. So that was my purview. Okay. Now I went to, and then I went to a Christian college and now I work in a pretty secular environment. Okay. So I have had to recognize that a lot of my, my, my purview and my paradigm has been, has been, um, formed by my inherent bias, by my childhood, by my experiences, by my circumstances. 
And you realize, you have to recognize that, just like somebody that has grown up in a very liberal Democrat, like you need to realize we all have an inherent bias. We all tend to see what we want to see and hear what we want to hear and surround ourselves with our echo chamber. So you have to check that. You have to A, recognize I have an inherent bias. B, you have to make sure that you're, like for me, I cross-referencing. I'm not just watching or looking at one news source, you know, I'm I am cross-referencing, I'm sourcing, I'm double sourcing. And for the for the listeners and for the viewers out there, don't just watch and listen to to one source. I mean, cross-reference, even if it's someone that's outside of your echo chamber, you owe that to yourself, especially in this time that we're in now, where the lines between journalism and, and commentary are really blurred. I mean, a true mm-hmm. journalist wants to be objective. I want more than anything. That was the biggest challenge for me on The View is trying to stay politically neutral because I was told to stay politically neutral, but I was placed on this like politically charged show. It was really tough. (laughs) So I could not imagine being in that position. I felt like a total failure. I'll be honest. Um, It was really tough. But I just I, I think at the end of the day, like we all have an inherent bias. Don't say none of us can say that we're we're not biased. None of us can say that we're completely objective. So guess what? recognize it and then yeah. take the steps to counteract like for me i'm just making sure that that my own like my own thought process that i'm that i'm playing the devil's advocate on the, on the opposite side of that you know to stay to stay neutral as a journalist but i think we owe it to ourselves to cross reference and to and to like be uncomfortable every now and then to challenge those norms you have to be ready to explain for the hope that is within you okay so, um, so, and that can be uncomfortable sometimes, but don't be afraid. It takes a lot of work. I'm trying to teach my kids about cross-referencing yes. and I'm like, yes. it takes so much work to read an article here and then notice the headlines. I'll scroll Fox and I'm like, huh, look at those headlines. I'm a New York Times subscriber. I scroll that and I'm like, wow, these look totally different. I go to NPR to hear mm-hmm. that. It just, <laughs> it takes so much work, but it's worth it is what you're saying. Yeah, and it's interesting because in, in a class, a, like a clear cut case of inherent bias is we can all listen to the State of the Union. We can all listen to, um, you know, any sort of speech and we have a take on it. And like, why can, how can three different outlets have three completely different takes on it? It's because we all have an inherent bias, right? We all do. So we see what we want to see and we hear what we want to hear. So that's why it's up to you to kind of like form your own opinion. You're a big girl, you're a big boy, like you can do this, but just take the extra time to do it and owe it to you, owe it to yourself. And it's good to challenge yourself. It's good to be a little uncomfortable every now and then, to know why it is that you believe what you believe and to be able to hold that conviction. I love that you brought up Echo Chamber. <laughs> I I have a fiery 14-year-old and we are a mixed race family, so I have a mm-hmm. son who is black and mm-hmm. The Black Lives Matter conversation, we are all lit up and very excited actually about, you know, talk about people exploring their biases. And mm-hmm. more than ever, white people have been willing to actually consider, gosh, maybe I do have racist ways of thinking and I yes. do need to see color because color does have such an input on how I see the world. And um, so she's on fire and she's on TikTok. That's a dangerous combination. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me just tell you. <laughs> I don't know if you're there yet with your daughter. Oh gosh, um, I'm just, trying. Oh, I'm trying to avoid TikTok, but it's impossible. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. We just went there, so we we held off pretty long as she's going into high school. Um, one of the things she was, you know, showing me some very opinionated videos, and perhaps I even agreed with their point of view. But I am wanting her to understand. Okay, you can be really opinionated, but she immediately was like there's this person I'm following and they said this and I'm unfollowing. And I was trying to challenge her on that. And I know there's this cancel culture right now. And I I was trying to say, you know, hey, you can be opinionated, but also you want to be a woman of influence. And so how can you win influence towards your opinion? And so how, how are Tell me what you think about, yeah, how can we teach our children to hold these tensions of being opinionated, especially as young women, we're often told to be quiet, that we don't have a voice at the table. So I'm I'm not wanting oh, to tell her to not gosh. be opinionated, but I'm also wanting her to have this 
unbiased understanding that she's coming from a point of view and where someone else comes from. It's because of how they grew up. You know, you could have landed just where they land if you'd grown Mm -hmm. up exactly in their shoes. So, yeah, I think it's so important. I just was having some conversations with my daughter the other day where she had the best of intent, but is the way that she went about it. And I said, honey, do you realize if you just would have changed your tone in this conversation, it would have changed the entire dynamic and the entire dialogue. I said, I know what your intent was, but the way that you went about it. I said, you can say, you can, you, you, if you just would have changed the way that you said it. And so I think with kids, like you want them to have an opinion. You want them to do their research. I tell, I, 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 I try to reinforce this with my daughter. I'm like, I don't want to know what you're against. I want to know what you're for. I want you to be at the table, but don't just come to the table and tell me what you don't. Don't just tell me what you're against. Come to the table respectfully and say, here are my issues, my three issues, but here are my three solutions. You come to the table equipped. You come to the table well-versed and researched, and you tell me what your issues are, but then you tell me what the solutions are. I don't just want to know what you're against. I want to know what you are for. And guess what? You can come to the table and tell me anything you want as long as you do so in a respectful manner. Mm-hmm. So that's, 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 what so I'm trying, that's what I'm trying to teach her. I want her to be a strong and courageous and independent woman, uh, but I want her to be a respectful woman. And I think that's, that's what we're missing in society is just that base level respect. And because if we were truly respectful of one another and truly tolerant of one another, it would be enough for us to believe what we believe and for somebody else to believe what they believe. That's true. That like, that's tolerance. That's being able to respect. You know what? I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you at all, but I can still respect you. Right. You have to be able to agree to disagree and re- still respect the human being. And we don't. Mm-hmm. We don't. We make character assassinations. And we are a culture where we try to ruin people. We want to ruin people instead of rehabilitate them. That's so true. Oh my gosh. The so visceral. It's so visceral, which is why I'm you have so much courage to be in an environment, a journalistic environment, which is you know, in a lot of ways. I mean, we had someone named Max Dossel. He's from the Center of More Humane Technology. I discovered them on 60 Minutes a couple of years ago. And our last podcast series was about digital health. And so I wanted to have him come on because he was a tech insider. He was the one who created the algorithms of the apps and then realized he wanted to be on the other side. And so he really went into how clickbaity the news needs to be in order to get the advertising dollars and just how even what comes across your screen, it's already been filtered for you from your own bias of what you already click on. So, And that's tough. And guess what? That's tough and it's uncomfortable. It can be really uncomfortable and it can be painful at times. But any sort of growth requires pruning. And sometimes that pruning is deep. Any sort of growth requires us stepping out of our comfort zone. And you are becoming a professional stepping out of your comfort zone, or I bet you never would have thought that years ago. I'm a I'm a professional person that makes leaps that don't make sense. That's what I'm becoming <laughs> a professional at. Courage is so contagious. And I think that is what I was just, I was so excited to talk with you today because you are demonstrating so much courage. And I'm wondering, we always ask everyone on the Going Scared podcast as we wrap up, how are you going scared now? I know you mentioned there's some stuff going on that you can't totally tell us about, but you know, what I have found is when I've made those courageous steps in my life to move forward, you know, for me, it was starting a social impact business and then fast growing and sticking with it and dealing with mom guilt and all of the things that we, we go through as we continue to stick to our convictions and um, I've noticed that, you know, those first few steps of courage, they just become addictive. Now I just, I want a lifestyle of courage. Mm-hmm. Yes. And how are you continuing to choose courage in your life right now? Well, I'm continuing to choose courage because I know what's on the other side of it. I know when I look back at the moments where fear and discouragement have ruled me and have paralyzed me, there was no growth. There was hindrance. There was complete paralysis. And I have come to the point where I've realized, guess what? Fear is not something that I'm going to conquer. Fear, I should expect fear. I should anticipate fear. But in many, like, especially in big decisions, 
fear is going to rear its ugly head, but it is up to me to step in into it, to press into my fear, to step out on that staircase when I can only see the first step in front of me and to live a life that's rooted in faith and trust, trusting that I have a peace in my spirit that this is what I'm supposed to do. I can have a peace. I can still be scared as hell about it. That's totally normal. It's normal to feel fear. So once I embraced like knowing that fear is normal and that I should expect and anticipate it, I'm like, let's go for it. And you know what? What's the worst possible thing that could happen on the other side of it, of stepping into, of stepping into that fear? What's the worst thing? But guess what? The worst thing is being paralyzed by it. Mm. That's worse than actually not taking that step. That's worse than not taking the, the leap of faith. That's worse than not trusting what's on the other side of it is the paralysis that this is going to rule you instead of you ruling it. And the only way to see that it doesn't have to rule you is by stepping through it. That's the only way it's, through yes. our fears. And I imagine you looking back to walking away from GMA weekend and walking away from The View and deciding really to put the brakes on your career mm -hmm. in some ways. I mean, let me ask you, do you regret that? No, not at all. I will say like an addict, I was addicted to my job. I was addicted to this significance that I found in it. And an addict always misses that high. There are moments I miss being the it girl. I miss being mm. the next big thing because I took myself out of that rotation in many regards. But um, no, I mean, I, I am so grateful. I, I, I was scared for a long time though. My fear paraly I was scared, paralyzed me. I was scared of what I was walking away from, these two dream jobs, and I was scared of what I was walking into. I didn't know what it looked like. But that's the thing. So often we want to see that next chapter before we have finished write, writing the one that we're in, but that's not how it works. It's just not. Mm -mm. Um, you, if you, but ask, if you have a piece about it, I say that's the first step. If you have a piece, proceed. And then the next step, expect fear. Just expect mm. it and anticipate it. It's normal, but it is up to you. You get to press into it. You get to push through it. And you get to be stronger on the other side. And then you get to branch out, do new things. And you get to say, my fear didn't rule me. Instead of, instead of I, you know, I got to rule my fear. I told mm. my fear where to go. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I'm excited about what's next. I don't really know what it looks like, but um, I, I know without a doubt that I have a peace in my spirit that I'm supposed to be moving in a particular direction. And it is scary, but I know that uh, I'm going to take those steps because I have a peace about it. That's where it all starts for me is the peace. If you have a peace, proceed. It's so powerful to think about that fear and peace can coexist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's true because so often we say, oh, that's my intuition telling My fear is my intuition telling me I shouldn't proceed. That's a lie. Your peace is in your spirit. Mm. Fear can get in your heart and in your head. Fear, mm. I just say like you should expect fear and, and, and anticipate it in big and small decisions but the fear and the peace can coexist. And don't tell yourself, oh, my intuition is my fear. No, fear is, will rear its ugly head and fear will try to slay your dream. Fear will try to rob you of what you, what you know in your spirit you're supposed to be doing. Do not mm -hmm. let it rule you. You need to rule it. You need to step into it. Mm -hmm. But know that it's nothing that you're going to be like cured of or conquer. I mean, it's mm -hmm. going to be present. And that's the thing I think Especially as a woman of faith, I was like, oh, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be plagued by fear anymore. Like, no, fear is going to be there throughout your life, but it's up to you to press into it and, and to step into it, press past it. It's going to be there. Just expect it. If there's nothing wrong with you. You have done anything wrong. You are normal to feel this, but it's up to you. You get, you get to tell it where to go. Mm. You, you get to press into it. Own it. Don't let it own you. I love that. Just normalizing fear. I had that the other day. I was feeling nervous. Uh, I was doing a podcast interview and I had been on a break for a few weeks. And so, you know, you take a break, you feel a little rusty. And I, my stomach was churning that morning and I was like, gosh, I'm kind of anxious. What, what is this? Why am I anxious today? I've got a great day. And then yeah. I was like, oh, I'm doing a podcast interview and I'm feeling a little rusty. And you know what? That's pretty normal to feel that fear of anticipation, a little bit of anxiety when you haven't done something in a while. That's okay. Yes. And 
just even becoming aware of it and then saying, this is, this is actually a good thing. This is a normal thing. I'm just going to invite this to come along, but I'm not going to let it paralyze me. I'm not going to cancel the interview because I'm afraid right now. Yes. I'm just going to walk through it. And I was done with the interview. It was a lovely, powerful conversation. And I went about my day. So I yep. think that's so powerful, just recognizing that fear is normal. Uh-huh. Totally. You have to normalize it. You have to normalize it. And there's some, nothing wrong with you when you feel it. Honestly, you're, you're part of you know, you're part of the, you're just, you're one of the rest of us. You're, so you're a human being. You're a human being. You are. And we're human beings, not human doings. I hate that, but it's true. Like you're, there's nothing wrong with you at all. You're, you're, you're normal. While it does require more effort to get your news from multiple sources, it enables you to get a more unbiased view of the story. You'll find me within the same hour on Medium, New York Times, Fox, World Magazine website, NPR, and Wall Street Journal. Paula's grounded perspective and powerful message around bringing respect and being able to disagree without being disagreeable are words I've been living by. We'll catch you next week with our next guests my own executive coach, Marie Case, where we'll be digging in deep when it comes to how we listen can actually change the course of a conversation. To keep up with Paula, head on over to paulaferrisofficial.com and check out her new book called Out, Why I Traded Two Dream Jobs for a Life of True Calling. Make sure you head on over and rate this podcast because it helps other people find the show. Our wonderful music for today's show is by my good friend, Ellie Holcomb. Going Scared is produced by Eddie Kohlfoltz. And I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared. <laughs>